I was up here about a month ago for Mother's Day, so here it is Father's Day, and I'm up again. Huh. <laughs> it wasn't planned, but there you go. So, what's that? <laughs> so, so here it is Father's Day again. It's another one of those holidays created by greeting card companies to increase our guilt and their profit. Hmm. <laughs> I, I looked to see what the history of Father's Day was, and there doesn't really seem to be much pagan. There's a couple of strange ones out there, but it's not that. It's just kind of a world of thing. Kind of started in Spokane in the early 1900s. Um, doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just, just interesting. <clears throat> but there definitely is a lot of profit to be made off of these holidays, isn't there? And, and our capitalistic system supports that. And that's not necessarily wrong. It can be irritating at times, but it's not necessarily wrong. So we're going to talk about Father's Day, a couple of different aspects of it. Of course, we'll start in Genesis 18, 19. I say, of course, but that's lots of options. Genesis 18, 19, talking about uh, Abraham and God talking about him. Uh, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So Abraham was a good father. He was going to command his children well in the way of the Lord. And that's excellent, isn't it? One thing we know is that children will find the boundaries. So if you have the way of the Lord as the central thing, maybe the boundaries won't be too far out. And speaking about that, Deuteronomy 6, starting at the sixth verse of Deuteronomy 6. I'll go through a few of these fairly quickly, hopefully, which says, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, these words, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlet be, frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. So God is commanding, he's given his word, and he's passing on that commandment to teach the children. And how much? Well, when you sit down, when you lie down, when you get up, frontlets between your eyes. How much time are you f spending thinking about God if it's right here? Write him on the posts of your house. Do, do our neighbors know what we think? Do we really express it like that, at least to our children? My goodness. I'm going to have a weird verse next. Jeremiah 17.9. Jeremiah 17.9 which says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Ouch. So question for all of us, when does this start? When you're an adult? No, anybody who's had kids knows better than that. It starts right away, doesn't it? You're born selfish. You're not born an angel or a saint. You're born selfish and you need to fulfill your needs, you need to live. But that has to be trained out for you to think of others, doesn't it? Training has to start. Now, we read, just read Abraham apparently was training well, and the commandment was to train 24-7. So I read this verse because I want to read next from Proverbs 23, starting at verse 13 heart is deceitful. Who can know it? Proverbs 23, 13, which says, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. I don't want my kids to die. I don't know if I beat them enough or not. 
<laughs> they probably have an opinion on that. You can ask them. <laughs> Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. You know, that doesn't make sense in today's culture, does it? That's, you know, you're, you're a horrible, evil person if you spank your kids. But this is here. I believe, however, and it may be a little politically correct, that if you taught your children like Abraham did 24-7, the necessity of the rod is minimized. If you live it, if you teach it, if it's frontless between your eyes, it's not eliminated because the heart is deceitful. It's, it's necessary. The world's teaching on this subject is only zero, zero rod. And their children, let's read the last part of verse 14 again, deliver his soul from hell. The children who have zero are like the children from hell, aren't they? I mean, I, I'm not judgmental, but you can look around, look at the stuff going on in the cities and everything where the correction isn't. It's horrific. So is this good advice? Well, let's keep reading verse 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Now, that's true of God's heart, but our heart, too, if we're a father or a parent and a child does something right, how glorious is that? Verse 16, yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. That doesn't happen if it's not right there in front of them 24-7, does it? Let not thine heart envy sinners. Ooh, that's a problem. But be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. You know, fear has many different levels. Terror so that you don't do anything is not what we're talking about here. Fear as in recognizing he is God. <clears throat> For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute, envy in the sinners. Yeah, that just looks like fun, doesn't it? I want to do that. Well, a lot of us believe in having fun. We do sledding, bicycle rides, you know, everything. We, we, we have fun, and that's A-OK. -okay. But this is different, isn't it? Wine bibbers, riotous eaters. Verse 21, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. There's actually a worldly reason, and the world knows this. If you live that lifestyle, if you live for the weekend of partying, Many of us actually have jobs, and we work, work around people like that. They get to be my age, and they're still renting a run-down house. They're in debt to their eyeballs, and they don't know which way to turn. They didn't really quite grow up. Verse 22, hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And here's a great verse, verse 24. The father of the righteous shall, shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wild, wise, not wild, wise child shall have joy of him. Yeah, that's what we're looking for, isn't it? Rejoicing, wise children. We want to be wise children, and we want to have wise children. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. This advice is not just about the rod, is it? It's about a whole system of how to handle your children and how to be as a child. Be wise. Another duty of a father. Let's turn to Psalms 82 and the third verse. We'll kind of keep on talking about the things from Proverbs there. The Psalms 82, 3, which says, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Others sometimes need fatherly help because not everybody is from a 
full family. Things happen. Sometimes it's not even the family's fault. Often it is, but sometimes it's not. So there's a requirement for those of us that are able to help with fatherly help for others in whatever way you can. Because fatherless families suffer more. They just do. And I have some figures here that you can find lots of different values for these, but the ones that I'm going to report here are middle of the road or lower middle. There's lots of fig figures, analysis that are way higher than these. Fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. That's the successful suicides. Attempted suicides are much higher. 80% of convicted rapists, convicted rapists. 75% of teenage dropouts, 75% of youth in drug abuse centers, 85% of youth in prison, 70% of teen pregnancies, and there's others. So we see it at a heartbeat, at a glance, that fatherless homes are a problem. So parents, if you love your kids, stay together. Wow. So how long are you a parent for? Job 1. Let's turn to Job 1, verses 4 and 5. And hopefully we're all kind of familiar with Job. Uh, this, this part of it has always interested me. And talking about his kids. And his, Job's sons, went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Well, didn't we just read about partying, riotous, and drunkenness? Yeah. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them. I wonder how he did that. And rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. That's how he did it. He sacrificed. And Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, my looking at this, I'm not sure I've got this completely understood. It looks like those were adult children. And he is praying and sacrificing to, for help for them to not sin. Kind of sounds like we've been studying in Sunday school class, David's children. You know, David kind of let things go sometimes. How come David and Job didn't appear to correct their children when they should have? By our judgment, which might not be accurate. Maybe it was their age. Maybe it was their age and they were kind of, you know, hoping they'd figure it out. I don't know. On the other side of that coin, let's turn to Ephesians 6, starting at the first verse. Ephesians 6. The other side of the coin. Children. We're all children of somebody, aren't we? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. I didn't use this verse on Mother's Day. I used Exodus 20, 12. But this subject is throughout the script, scriptures, isn't it? Honor thy father and mother. Verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Do you think that means you're going to be living to 100, 120? No. It's talking about eternal life, isn't it? If you respect your father and mother, God is going to bless you for that. Everybody young hear that? I'm young. I hope I hear it. Verse 4, and ye fathers, kind of the came, reason I came here, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, there comes an age of a child when it's inappropriate to use the rod, right? We've talked about that, but there comes a time when it's not appropriate anymore. Would that provoke the children to wrath? Maybe, maybe. Societal pressures aside, you know, ignore what society thinks because they have their own agenda. 
when your child gets to an age of understanding and their IQ is in the adult range, other forms of correction are probably advisable with love and compassion. And with wisdom, never forgetting what you as a child were able to get away with and you think your kids are dumber than you? Not likely. They're probably getting away with things too, just the way it is. Nonetheless, you don't provoke, provoke your children to wrath. So wisdom is the answer here, isn't it? What kind of wisdom works right? Godly wisdom. Keep it in front of their face, morning, noon, and night. Yeah. If you think the schools are going to help your kids, man, if you're lucky, they might teach them reading, writing, and arithmetic anymore. I'm not sure that's always the case. But they are not going to teach them God and morality. Seems they might even be teaching anti that. So I think our job has increased in recent time. That's, that's what I'm seeing. <clears throat> so, Two examples of fathers. I chose Eli and the prodigal son's father. What do we have there? We've actually read quite a bit about Eli in recent Sunday school studies, but it's excellent material. First Samuel 2, starting at verse 27. First Samuel 2, 27. And there was a man of God, excuse me, left out an important word, and there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Yeah, you have a special place here. You're going to be first in line to reap benefits of the offerings. Verse 29, wherefore, God is saying, look what I did. And then he says, wherefore, or why, kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering? What are you, what are you doing? Which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me. Oh, wait a minute, teaching your children. Eli was having a problem of honoring his sons above God. And God doesn't think that's appropriate. Hmm. hmm. After that, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wow. So, if you keep reading here, so Eli and his family were cut off because Eli didn't correct his children well. He didn't do anything. But yet, let's back up in the chapter, and even before this, it, this has always interested me, the order that this is given. Backing up to verse 22, same chapter. Backing up here, verse 22. So now Eli was very old, so already he's old, and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. What? Yeah, this is being said. You know, we've, we've, we've studied Israel. They, they had problems. What's this? The priest's sons. Oh, my goodness. And he said unto them, why do ye such things? This is Eli talking to his sons. Why are you doing this? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. So Eli is aware they're not doing this in a secret way that he doesn't know. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? So Eli is correcting them. He said, hey, this is a problem. But what's the response? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father. 
because the Lord would slay them. God had a plan. They chose it. And Eli, what did he do about it? Well, he talked to them. How come he didn't do more? Wouldn't you do more? Well, that's a rhetorical question, isn't it? We all think we would do more. Would you stop your children from, from doing these things? I would like to think that I would. But they ignored him. What should Eli have done? He just talked to them. I think he should have done something. He should have removed them from their duties as, as being priesthood, shouldn't he? Would God have accepted that? Well, I don't know, but he should have done that. It may have saved his son's lives. But because he was a wimp, it, he didn't save their lives. Okay, next chapter, 1 Samuel 3 and verse 12. 1 Samuel 3, 12. says, in that day I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. He knows about this. Because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. We just read it. He talked to them, but he didn't restrain them. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. So how long are we parents for? Job did the best he could with his kids. Um, Eli talked to him, but he didn't restrain them, whatever that means. And they were adults. And he was still responsible for a restraining. Why? Because he was a priest of God. He had the authority and power to do that. You know, so you don't always have that kind of power over your kids, and it wasn't because they were his kids. It was because he was a priest. It was an interesting situation. All right, compare that to the prodigal son story, Luke 15, 11. Luke 15, 11. This story has always interested me. <clears throat> caused me to think a lot. And he said a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. This isn't maybe that unusual of a thing. Hey, Dad, come on. Just, I know it's early, but I, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an adult now. Help me out here. And this is where I get a little confused. And he divided unto them his living. Dad said, okay. Was it an adult, adult child? Yeah, probably. I don't know. Verse 13, and not many days after, duh, who, who didn't see this coming? And not very long down the road, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance of riotous living. We read that in Proverbs, didn't we? Yeah, nothing new here. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. I wonder if God had any input in that. And he began to be in want. How long does it take to spend a fortune or a small fortune? Yeah, it doesn't take long, does it? And when he had, oops, excuse me, verse 15, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Well, you know what? You got to eat. So he, he found any job he could. A minimum wage minus about 90%. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He wasn't making enough to live on. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, when he woke up, he said, okay, man, all right, 
we got to do something different here. <clears throat> when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? Reality hit home, didn't it? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. So he rehearsed this, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. So he lost everything, didn't he? And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead. He was dead. Right? This is an interesting point. Remember this. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Good story, sort of. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, what, what, what do these things mean? And he said unto him, Thy brother is come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. The next is, sounds like something Peter would have done, or, or me. And he was angry. Whoa, wait a minute. He got all of his stuff, and he went and spent it. He was angry and would not go in. Yeah, do we have pride like that? Oh, my goodness, yes. At least I can speak for that. I don't know about you guys. I hope you're better than that. Therefore came out his father and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might marry, make merry with my friends. Dad, what are you doing? This guy wasted your money and you, you treat me Nowhere near that good. But as soon as this thy son was come, he hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make Mary and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, was lost, and is found. So some of the thoughts that I've had thinking about this story. Like Eli, this dad seemed to allow the prodigal son everything he craved. Did he? Hmm. But unlike Eli, this dad knew what happened and considered that the son was dead. He was not part of the family anymore. He, he, he was gone, dead. He was out of the will. Verse 32 shows that. It's, uh, verse 31, sorry. All that I have is thine to the other son that didn't run off. In fact, dad made it clear. Everything that was left was going to the older son. Dad is just happy that the younger son seem to learn his lesson. He can at least live in the house, but the house isn't his. There are different ways to teach, and it's a parent's responsibility to make sure it's, it gets taught. There was a lot of sacrifice that went on in this for the dad, a little bit for the older brother, but they did teach the prodigal son. He figured it out. Did he actually repent in spirit? I, I, the story doesn't give enough information, does it? Can't tell. It looks like it was a pre-planned thing, and I got to have a bite to eat, so I'm going to get on my knees and make it work here. But Dad didn't question that. We as Christians often work out that. You take somebody at their word, because you can't read the heart, you can't judge. So, 
We've been talking about mortal fathers. Who is the ultimate father? God, right? Jehovah, Yahweh. Jesus called God my father 53 times in the New Testament. Our father 21 times. Your father 21 times, if my counting was correct. And he said, I am my father zero times. Just a side note. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, that... that Never is said, is it? Um, John twenty seventeen, one one of the one of the times here. John twenty seventeen, a wonderful verse. It's often misinterpreted, but it also proves a whole lot about where Jesus was not in the three days that he was dead. Jesus saith unto here, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and to your Father and to my God and your God. Okay, just wanted to read that verse talking about fathers and who he is relative to Jesus, relative to the ladies that were there. My Father, your Father, my God, your God. So he's the same to God as we are to God. Interesting. Interesting. Turn to Luke 12, verse 27. Luke 12, 27. Talking about the ultimate father here. The real father. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. I'll bet Solomon had some pretty fancy clothes, though, and fancy food. Really. <laughs> if then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Yeah, God knows our needs. Absolutely. Just like he knows what the, the birds and the flowers need. Verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. God is able to provide those things, and he will provide those things. Or not, if you don't seek him. But I love verse 32. I love it. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is what God wants. How's that for a father? He's going to give us the kingdom. So on the other side of the coin, as a Father's Day present, <laughs> we want our Father to be happy to give us the kingdom, which means we have to love and obey him. Yeah, we have to be his children. Verse 33, sell that ye have and give alms. Whoa, what? He's just giving us the kingdom. And then he says, sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourself bags that wax not old. That's not any kind of bag you can carry, is it? A treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. So I've been one to point out who was talking and to whom. You know, we, we did some of that this morning too. This isn't the rich man that he's talking to this time. The young rich man who Jesus loved, but who wouldn't obey and walked off sorrowful. This is to everybody? I think so. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. My little thought here. So if you don't sacrifice for the Lord, where is your heart? I think those last two verses Kind of make a point. If you don't sacrifice for the Lord, where is your heart? Where is your treasure? Hmm. Verse 35, let your loins be girded about 
Let your lights be burning. Not girded about with fancy dresses, right? But truth and love and mercy. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants, I pray that it's all of us, whom, when, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and shall make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, watching that is, blessed are those servants. watching, obeying, loving. So Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. I'd like to finish with Romans 8, verses 14 through 18. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, Spirit of God, his mindset, his word, his love, his truth. Mindset mostly, right? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That's a little different than the Old Testament. Abba is kind of like daddy. It's a term of endearment. It is God. It is, it is Father. But it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This is all a task right now that we're doing, isn't it? And it's going to be so much better. God had a plan, has a plan. It's going to happen. He loved us first. He wants to be our father. He is our father. Even if we don't obey, it's just that you have a choice of being the wise children or not the wise children, right? We may honor our mortal fathers, but let's make sure that we love, honor, obey, and fear God, our father, and recognize that he first loved us. Let's have a song. Thank you. We'll conclude with song number 291. Give of your best to the master, number 291.
close with a word of prayer. Our almighty and loving Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord, that you loved us and created us and gave us this life and gave us a hope to be with you in the kingdom wherein you will eventually live on the earth with us, Lord. We look forward to that day and thank you for that hope and that love and the love that your son who sacrificed for us, though he was unworthy of the death, his sacrifice for us. Lord, help us to sacrifice also for our children and for all that we have opportunity to help. The fatherless and the widows and so many, Lord, help us not to think of ourselves first, but to build treasure with you as we have opportunity. Lord, we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.